All right, so the, the thing is, some of the prescriptions of MGTOW, as you would have heard of my video. Yeah. With, like, first of all, let's, let's define, because now, since we're now talking about it, people will not know what we're talking about. Okay. So for, how do you define MGTOW? What's your name, first of all? Matthew. Good to meet you, Matthew. Nice to meet you. Yeah, okay. So how do you define it? Um, just men's rights activists. All right, so what, what differentiates a MGTOW then from a, red, from a general red pillar? I guess someone who's kind of, I guess it's kind of a guy that doesn't let kind of toxic masculinity get in his way of doing what he wants to do. Who are the main representatives of MGTOW? I don't think we have one. That guy that well, I was, this is called Sandman oh, or something yeah, like yeah, that. Sandman. Yeah, Sandman. I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I'm on his side on everything. But would, um, yeah. I, guess, I, I haven't seen that many yeah. like representatives yeah. of the MGTOW movement. Yeah. It, like, he's probably one of the most yeah. brazen ones or something, right? Yeah. All right, well, look, the thing is, a lot of what, what are you feeling? Tell me what you're feeling. What, what is the reason what made you actually become MGTOW or, you know, what seduced you to this ideology or this way of thinking? I guess it's just kind of like, I felt like there was an inequality, but unlike how kind of society tells us, I think society tells us a lot that like women have less rights than men, but it's kind of like to me personally, I never really felt like that. I always felt like kind of men had less rights than women did. Can I ask you a question? You don't have to answer it if you don't want to, yeah? That's okay. Um, has, was there any event that took place in your life, a personal event, that after that event, you felt like this made more sense than you would have otherwise maybe felt? What do you mean? Was there some relationship that you were in, maybe, that ended in a very negative manner? No, I've, I, I'm, I'm not, I've never been in a divorce or anything like that. Right, right. Not divorce, but like, let's say, for example, any breakup, uh, which, which you felt like you are hard done by or that you felt embittered because of. Uh, no, it wasn't so much relationships. It was just kind of like, I mean, I did get beaten up when I was 15. By, by whom? Like another guy. Okay. So like, it wasn't so much relationships, yep. but just kind of, kind of expectations from society. Whereas like, yeah. men are taught to kind of be like big, strong, rough. I'm with you. Okay, so my question to you is, MGTOW, some of their prescriptions involve complete isolation from women, right? Yeah. Which is quite similar to radical feminists because radical feminists say, you know, they, they, a lot of them prescribe lesbianism yeah. as a way forward. Now, the issue with that is that it destroys any sense of complementarity. Yeah. You see, do you, what, what, what has made you feel like that's the right argument to make? Like, first of all, do you accept that? Do you, do you feel like being alone and not relying on women is, is the way to go? Or do you feel like, well, what is it exactly? Um, Do you want to try and elaborate on that further? Right, right, because when I was, because once again, I was looking at like, you know, forums and stuff, because they don't have, they don't have actual written works, yeah. except for what I've read, read from Royal Tomasi, the rational male and stuff, but he's not mixed out. Yeah. But he does elaborate their positions and stuff. But what I'm saying is that when I was reading, when I was listening to Sandman and others, it seemed to me like the highest level is a, is a man who isolates himself from women. He does not, connect with them. He lives in, he, for example, one of the prescriptions was like, have a woman that, you know, you pay for her services or something like that. So you don't have to be, you don't have to be harmed by, for example, this is a big thing, it's a big theme. It's a massive theme. And I think rightfully so, yeah? Like, for example, in the Western world, we have like uh, men being stripped away from the rights to see their children in particular situations, yeah? So in order to avoid that scenario, you should completely separate yourself from women. To what extent do you agree with such proposition? To the extent, in fact, to be fair to him, he says that, except for if you want sexual services or something like that, maybe you can get an escort or go to Thailand or something like that. I don't know what, exactly what his prescription was, but he was, he was trying to, you know, make a man less reliant on a woman's actions as much as possible. That's my understanding of MGTOW. Okay. What do you think of it? Is my understanding correct? Is, to what extent, if it is, what, to what extent do you agree with that? I think it's, I think, it's, um, I think it's kind of, because a lot of, because MGTOW's kind of a movie that a lot of other guys have mixed opinions on. And I think it's gone as far to the...
Whereas like guys just have their own opinion of what Nick Tout is while cutting off what, what other guys think Nick Tout is. Let me ask you a question. What are your main concerns? So you mentioned one of them, that you feel like there's been this narrative. Yeah. In the Red Pill community, they call it the gynocentric order, yeah? So there's this narrative of like, women have not been given their rights, whatever, and you feel like that narrative is false, and that in fact, your own grievances have been suppressed. Is this correct characterization? Yeah. All right, so what kind of grievances do you have then? Well, just kind of like, men are much more likely to face violent and hate crimes. Uh, men are much more likely to be homeless. Uh, men have a shorter life expectancy. I guess it's, men uh, also have less, I could be wrong here, but men have less sex than women do. I mean, that's controversial. But. No, I mean, uh, there was a, there was a, uh, less sex is a, is a bit of an interesting thing. There was a study done by Superdrug. Yeah. Uh, Superdrug actually put forward a study, right? To see how many sexual partners a man or woman have. Yeah. Both of them are around nine sexual partners, I think by the age of 21 or something like that. You'd be surprised. Uh, in terms of, because that's variety of partnership. Yeah. But then the question is of, maybe, maybe a woman will be in more a long-term relationship so she's having more sex. That's a question I haven't looked into, so I'm going to go and look into it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but the, the point is, is that um, I understand your grievances. Yeah. Okay. As a, as a Muslim, we believe in a complementarian system. Yeah. Okay. So we believe in a system of like checks and balances. We don't believe that men and women are equal yeah. or that equality of value means identicality of roles. Okay, we believe that we're equal on a, on a value perspective, like as intrinsic human beings, I have the same value as a woman, or if a woman has the same value as me, there's not ceteris paribus, right? There's no reason for that not to be the case. However, there are certain distinctive features that men have that women don't have and vice versa. And as such, they're tailored laws. Like for example, one of the most controversial ones, I'll give you two or three most controversial ones, you might have heard of already in the Islamic paradigm, is that a man, uh, is a kawam, which is that he has a managerial hierarchy in a house. Now, you, a woman, on the other hand, as a mother, is more is more influential as a mother. Yeah, it's, it's more influential as a mother. So, in other words, there's a check and balance going on here. Okay, there's checks and balances going on, and so one could argue that, well, in order to avoid this hierarchy, I won't get married. Or well, that this hierarchy, if it's, if, it's checked, if, if it's checked and balanced, if children are into the equation, then I ought not to get into a marriage because it's, there's a hierarchy there. Which I, so for example, a woman without a uh, child will not have the checks and balances. But the yeah. point is for us, it's not, the idea is not to try and create equality. Yeah. Equality of outcomes, even, even equality of outcomes, we don't say is a, is a favorable, um, out, it's not a favorable thing. It's not a good life. It could be that equality of outcomes can produce negative net results, yeah? So the point is for us is that we live in checks and balances. There are certain things that men and women have, men have it and vice versa, which creates a harmony. It calibrates the system, okay? So yes, a man will have a final say in major decision making, Islamic religion. A man can marry four women, whereas a woman can only marry one. The thing is though, we, I don't think we've ever lived in a society where men and women have actually been equal before, but we've lived through like centuries of men and women not being equal. So it's kind of like, we haven't actually fully officially tried it out of what life would be like if men and women were uh, Yeah, and, and the point would be like, you can't try it out. If you, I mean, if you did, I think you'd have an inefficiency. For example, let's take the Ukraine example, right? Now women are being evacuated or whatever. Women and children will be evacuated, but men are have to fight. Right. All right, so there is, the feminist call for equality is, is, is not applicable to that context because they realize the inefficiency of putting women on the front line. In this country, for example, the UK, women were not even allowed on the front line, I, th I think until fairly recently, because it's inefficient to have weaker uh, people on the front line. And so the, my, my argument is this, is that I feel like the MGTOW prescriptions are a step too far. I think they are, they force or they encourage men to be cowardly. I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because in reality, there are these problems in life. That there's always going to be some level of tension between men and women. But the, I'm talking about the prescription which you haven't agreed with anyway, which is the idea that we should be separating ourselves, which is similar to the radical feminist prescription. Separating ourselves from the bulk of the other sex. I don't think that's the answer. I think the answer is 
that we should re-establish a relationship with women, but with new terms. The terms are these, that there are going to be some rights I have as a man that you as a woman are not going to have, and vice versa. There are going to be some things I get that you're not going to get. And that is based on the fact that we are physiologically and biologically and anatomically different. That's based on the fact that that will bring forth the most efficient outcomes. So, for example, the Islamic prescription of a woman to breastfeed for two years. That's a, a man can't do that physically. Even to the point where Ngozi, who wrote a book called The Feminist Manifesto, she was, she was saying everything should be exactly the same, equal, whatever, except for breastfeeding, because she realizes a biological impossibility here. But we're saying, where does it, why does it stop there? If you, if you realize that having breast milk is something which is advantageous, why not also realize that a mother being in the child's life for X amount of years is also advantageous to the child? Why not also realize that, according to all the studies that we have, for example, Farron's book, you know, The Myth of Male Power, I'm not sure if you've read it. This is a very important book, you should read it, yeah? Uh, yeah, and The Boy Crisis. Farron's books are important, yeah? In the men's right uh, world, or the backlash literature world, yeah? where he talks about the advantage of a nuclear family. Okay, so if you, and when I was talking to particularly, it was a person called Nicholas Wolfinger, and he does demographic studies on marriages and stuff like that, yeah? And he, he unequivocally told me this, and it's online, that in fact, a nuclear family, which is religious in particular, where there's frequent religious practice, is most efficient in terms of outcomes, in terms of, like a child's uh, more likely to have a higher education, more likely to be, uh, less likely to be involved in delinquentism and, and criminality and so on. So we know what the structure is which caused the best outcome. And if men and women, instead of this kind of like, I would say, uh, you know, partisan, yeah, kind of discussion, we focus on children. Okay, what is in the best outcome or the best thing of the children? the next generation. I think if we both come to that conclusion and we, we re-establish the terms of engagement based on these principles which are most efficient, then I feel like there's, there's going to be a positive outcome here. How does that sound to you? Um, Is that reasonable? I'm not quite sure to be honest. <laughs> Alright, think about it. But what I would say is, look, do you know, let me tell you something, okay? I personally believe in the following. I personally believe that human beings are fundamentally, psychologically egoistic. Yeah. That f not, not ethically, but psychologically, fundamentally, we care about ourselves. There's, there's a narcissism in all of us. Yeah. Fundamentally, if I, if I got my leg cut off, you would care less about that than if your own leg were cut off. Or even if your own mum's leg were cut, whatever. Yeah, I think so. It's, we are fundamentally wired that way. There is a deep, entrenched psychological egoism, yeah? That's because that's not us. It's just like we haven't tasted the pain. Yeah, exactly. So, fundamentally, things go down to two things. What's in my best interest? What's, what's going to remove my pain? What's going to increase my pleasure? A lot of it is like that, yeah? Now, that's a psychological condition. However, now, there's only one way to actually transcend it. Because in reality, to get the best outcomes, we must transcend that. Because egoism, if it's ethical egoism, it produces a conflict of interest. And a conflict of interest is always against your own interest, which is ironic. So being egoistic, being also about my rights, yeah, if it's a man doing it, whether it's gender egoism from a man's side to a woman or females to females or vice versa, is always going to create negative results, okay? Because there's going to be conflicts of interest that cannot be resolved, which are going to end up being against that person themselves, yeah? So the way to do this is to have a transcend transcendental idea. Something which goes above and beyond the call of uh, gender egoism. And we say that for, for, as Muslims, we say that that idea is God, basically. That we have to ask a more fundamental question. What is the purpose of life? And the purpose of life for us is that we worship God, that we submit to God and so on. You see? Because when you have a meaning in life, as Nietzsche said, if you have a why, almost any how is possible. Like what really will motivate a woman or a man? Well, let me ask you two questions. What, would, what is most likely to motivate a man to extract from his own resources so that he can upkeep his family, his children, rear his kids or whatever, even though that's against his economic interest? Likewise, what is most likely to, to make a woman obedient to a husband? Obedient to him, it's a very strong word in this managerial hierarchy acceptance of these things that even if it causes some level of insecurity or discomfort. 
I would say it has to be something which goes above and beyond the call of, okay, this is, I'm doing this for myself, it's in my best interest. It has to be, yes, it is in your best interest, but there's a transcendental idea, which is what? Which is a godly one. This is a metaphysic, you know, and it gives, it, it gives a whole gender discussion meaning. Which is why, I'll be honest with you, despite the fact that we also suffer from gender egoists from both sides in the Muslim world, Muslim feminists, or those who are influenced by them, and men that are too gender egoistic on their side as well. I feel like of all the religions in the world, maybe with the exception of Judaism as well, Islam and Orthodox Judaism has been able to keep the, the, the idea and the sacredity of the nuclear family intact. And there's a reason for that. And even Tomasi actually agrees with that. He, mentioned, he mentions that in his book, to be fair to him, yeah? And so what I'm saying is, the, the way forward, you're never gonna, what I'm gonna say is you're less likely to convince a man to extract his resources and sacrifice his life, or a woman to obey a man, if there isn't an overarching idea, which is that you're doing it for the sake of God, as part of your purpose of life and so on. That has consistently been shown to, to be the case. So I think there's a major disadvantage in trying to implement the most efficient types of family restructuring on a secular paradigm. I think that the religious paradigm is infinitely more powerful in being able to do so. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. I mean, I think one thing I have realized is that I think, I guess it kind of speaks out to kind of the rest of the world, where it's kind of like, I think the most secularized, secularized people, I think are often kind of faith religion at the most extreme level. And that's why, to the point that it kind of harms them mentally. So that's why they end up going secular. I understand, but look, all the evidence about religion and, and human contentment is against the thesis that you just mentioned. For example, Pew Research have done a, a study on human happiness. Yeah. And they said that the people that are most religious are actually the most happy. Right, yeah. There is a research on that. Yes, it's, it's, and Pew Research is seen as like the gold standard. Pardon? 2019. No, no, general society is not happy in Sweden. I, I, I feel like Sweden, first of all, has the highest level of suicide in the world. Especially male suicide, which we were talking about. Yeah. I mean, I mean, quite. Be honest. I'm, I'm saying, like, put the sociological studies to the side. Go to Sweden. Go to. No, no. I'm, I'm saying, go to, go to Sweden, and then go to any place you like in Africa. Any place you like. Any place you like in the whole of the Middle East. Just look at the people's faces. No, I'm being serious. So, 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 I know this sounds like a superficial remark. If you go to, I've been to Sweden many times. I've been to Norway many times, yeah? When you go to Scandinavia, I go to Scandinavia. I'm saying that, yes, the studies have shown, like for example, Forbes magazine have said this, the World Health Organization have said this, the highest level of depression are in countries like Sweden, yeah? And the United States of America. So the studies are there, but I'm just saying from a human, if you've traveled, you go to Sweden, you go to Norway, look at the people, just look at the people. Look how they interact with each other. Look at how they look in the streets. Look at their disposition and their temperament. And then go to, I'm from Alexandria in Egypt, yeah? Originally, that's where I'm from, yeah? Go to Alexandria. People are a bit complaining about the economic situation, yeah? But they're not like the people in Sweden. I, I promise you that. I went to Norway. And what do you think? I thought they were brilliant. I looked around. They're brilliant. I'm, I'm not saying they're not brilliant, but they're not happy. I'm saying that happiness is. A, people confuse the Human Development Index, which is um, it's an economic, it's, a, it's an economic thing. Yeah, with, with human happiness. That's the first thing. The second thing is. That that is that. It's called the Human Development Index. Oh, okay. Well, now I must be looking at another one. The, the, the Human Development Index. It, it puts together life expectancy, GDP per capita, and um, education levels and a few other things. I feel like there are like many, like every country, a lot of countries have their own version of what freedom is. So like, I guess Sweden uses it as like very liberal, but then there's another type of freedom in America, where it's kind of like, their freedom where like people are really crazy. But then... Yeah, yeah, I got and, you. And then, and then there's also... Well, America is, like, America's comparative, comparatively to Sweden, a very religious country, especially the Bible Belt. There's a lot of religion going on there. What I'm saying is that if you, the, the issue is this. First and foremost, I feel like there's a hidden presupposition. In my view, the purpose is actually to be happy. And in fact, you know, it's, it's not actually to be happy. And in fact, I think physio physiologically or psychologically, being happy all the time is not actually a good state to be in. Because if you think about it, from a, even from a, from a biological perspective, yeah, imagine having 
when you're happy, your dopamine goes up, right? Or serotonin or neurotransmitters go up. But the, the more euphoric you are, the more, the more you crash, in fact. So being a, a, a physiological, psychological state of euphoria or happiness or ecstasy all the time is not actually... So the Quran actually tells us what the, from our perspective, the best state to be in as a stable is not happiness, but is in fact tranquility. That's why the Quran states, for example, right? الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ I will, I will, I will translate. أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبُ So basically it says that the ones who believe and their hearts find tranquility in the remembrance of God, that surely with the remembrance of God do hearts find tranquility. So in other words, the best static state to have from an Islamic perspective or from a human perspective or at least what the prescription of the Quran is that is one of tranquility. If you have peaks of, uh, for example, ecstasy or euphoria, that's okay. But if, you, if it's too often, it will crash you. It, it will, you will not be in a positive mind frame, you see? So we, for, for us, we don't believe that happiness is where you should be going anyway. Tranquility is where you should be. Would you say there's a difference between being happy and doing something right? Is what you're trying to say. What I'm saying is that being happy is not always a good thing to be. Yeah. Sometimes it's okay not to be happy.